Today we've heard a story so good, it deserves a party. In fact, our passage is the third in a series of three, where the events are so good that they end in natural celebration. In Luke 15, Jesus begins with the story of a lost sheep that is found, and the shepherd throws a party. And then it's followed by a lost coin that is found, and the woman who found her missing coin throws a party. And now, as we've heard, the father finds a lost son, and no wonder he too throws a party. It shouldn't be much of a surprise that these three interconnected stories are among some of the most beloved parables that Jesus ever told. Who doesn't love a good story that ends in goodness and restoration and celebration? Or, as we are talking today, who doesn't love a story of delight? There are many things that can incite an intense enough form of pleasure within us that we would call it delight. A picturesque sunset over the vast ocean can take one's breath away. At one point, we, ta- we thought about uh, reading a passage from Song of Solomon today. Uh, I'll leave that there. <laughs> a scoring record broken on the basketball court can do it too. Bring us back. Or a moment where we realize we are doing the very things that we were made to do. And so on and so on, delight can be our experience. But in these three stories, delight erupts when one notices what is important, and they realize that it's been lost. They go out searching far and wide for it. And upon finding that valuable thing, searching gives way to celebration. In each of these stories, delight begins as an embodied experience. The searchers celebrate with their whole being. The shepherd who finds the lost sheep doesn't just throw a rope around its shoulder and drag it home because it it ran off. No, instead, the shepherd picks up what had been lost, throws it over his shoulders, and rejoices. The woman who lost the coin lifts her voice to let others know the good news so that they can share in it with her. And the father's response is most dramatic of all. As he sees his son off in the distance and recognizes his walk or his, his, uh, his outline, he runs to him, embraces him, and kisses the once missing child. And in each of the stories, what began as an embodied form of celebration does not remain an individual or an isolated event. In each story, the whole community is called together so that they can enjoy the celebration of delight. These three stories call us to envision new possibilities of things being put back together and being restored. However, the way we, or at least I was taught to hear these passages when I was growing up, uh, missed the point entirely. I was taught to hear these stories in this way. The Father is God, That doesn't seem like a huge surprise when reading a text from an ancient patriarchal culture. But I was also told that the younger son represents Christianity in its its new forming time. The Christians were those who realized that we are sinful and we have gone astray, but we return with sincere repentance of heart. And we are the ones who learn what it's like to be embraced with the arms of love. While the older brother represents the Pharisees, or more broadly, just Jewish understanding of God. A rigid and judgmental God. The brother who doesn't understand grace at all. 
Anybody else heard it that way? Just me? Okay. I heard it enough times for all of us. How about I say that? But Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish New Testament scholar, would ask us to realize that the original Jewish audience hearing a story like this, or hearing these three stories, were not nearly as suspicious of Jewish understandings as we may have been in the years since. She notes that uh, no one in that time would have considered such a, a clear division between a Jewish concept of God and a Christian concept of God. In fact, Christianity emerged out of Judaism, not opposed to it. If you read the Hebrew Bible, the, what we call the Old Testament, again and again, God is gracious, intensely so. If we might free ourselves from that way of reading this as, as a, a neat story about Christianity's triumph over Judaism, we'll see something different is going on in this story. We're wise to ask ourselves anew the question that we always ought to ask when, when Jesus offers a parable. Where are we in the story? Read anew, this story can be one of delight. The kind of delight of those who find what is missing. Especially after they have done the work of counting what is most important, noticing that something has been lost, and then seeking diligently to find it. Well, that way of reading it at least works for the first of the two stories, where the shepherd and the woman who lost her coin, they counted what mattered to them, a flock of sheep, a set of coins. They noticed that one had gone missing in both cases, and then they diligently sought for them. Upon finding what had gone missing, they rejoiced and they threw a party. It's a made-for-Hallmark movie script in the making. But of course, the story of the father and the two sons doesn't resolve quite as nicely as those first two stories. After all, there is still the older brother. Referring back to Dr. Levine once more, she notes that as much as the father knew that he had lost his younger son, he had lost another relationship too, the one with the older child. But for whatever reason, he didn't seem to notice what he had lost here. On the joyous occasion when, when he saw his younger son returning home and the father threw a party, he invited everybody. Well, everybody that is, except for the older son. The son only finds out about the party when he hears the commotion coming from the house and he asks another worker who's heading in to the party, what, what is happening? What is going on? The child who had never left home, who'd been faithful, diligent in his work, was not even considered when the father called them together for a celebration. We give this son a hard time, but no wonder he wasn't happy. Like the two stories before, the one about the missing sheep and the one of the missing coin, this too is a story about who counts. It's a story about who we will notice and when we pay attention, recognizing who is missing and who are we willing to go seek after. If we read it in that way, instead of the self-congratulatory, I'm glad I'm a Christian and not that old Jewish religion, we're asking better questions about discipleship. How do we love others? 
especially the ones we've maybe seemed to have lost somewhere along the way. I've been giving that some thought. Sometimes we don't just stand here and ask you to do things. We do the work, too. Especially, I've been thinking about the last eight months that I've served as your lead pastor here. I've been asking and thinking about how I spend my time and my energy, and I've been thinking about who have I counted? Who have I failed to notice? Who do I need to seek? For me, that answer has become abundantly clear. It's our African national siblings. Pastor Daniel is away ministering today in Des Moines, but he knows I'm going to say this. I recall being in a meeting that Barb was leading uh, with our African national board a few weeks ago. As we got to the end of our time together, we've begun a practice around here in our committee meetings of evaluating how the meeting went. We start with a feeling word because we spend a lot of time up here in our heads. We want to say, how how are we feeling about these moments together? In part, we want to listen in to the wisdom that our bodies might have to share, too. And when it came around to me, I said, I feel sad. I wasn't entirely sure why at that moment. I did feel sad, but I didn't know why. I started talking, a way of sort of processing where that feeling was coming from. And I realized that it had a lot to do with the fact that I have failed to pay attention, enough attention, to our African national siblings in this church. A Sunday where we're talking about delight, I suppose there's even some irony in this story too. Because when I consider our congregation and I think about who really knows how to get to places of delight, I'm sorry, folks, but our African national friends beat those of us with pale skin almost every time. Like in the story that we've heard today and the one about the coin and about the sheep, there is delight to be had in our midst. There is can be reasons for us to throw a party. And I decided I don't want to miss it anymore. I also realized it's one thing to stand in the pulpit and say that, it's another to do the diligent, intentional work of seeking. I've asked Barb, I've asked Pastor Daniel. I'm also asking you to help me do that work. There is delight in renewed connection that comes from noticing who counts and committing to seek them when we realize that they have been lost to us. We had a leadership orientation meeting in January. Anyone who serves on a church committee was invited to join this meeting. During that time, Ryan, as as he's been doing, led us in a discernment practice where we paid attention to a couple of things. One was the places where we feel stuck. Using the the Quaker language, we said these are ways closed. And then the other piece was looking at where we felt like things were moving, things were open. These are the way openings, way closed and way open. We asked the 30 or so individuals who were gathered in the Wesley Center that morning, and several people lifted up some places where they felt like we had really incredible energy around here. Some good things were happening. And we named some areas where it felt like we're stuck. We were missing something. And Miriam Mackey, where is Miriam? Yeah, yeah, our liturgist today as well. She knows I'm quoting her. (laughs) She said something that I have not been able to get out of my mind since then. She said, it seems where we are connecting with one another, the way is open and we have all kinds of energy among us. Does that resonate with anyone else? Yeah. 
But the places where we think that the way has been closed up are the places where we can say, we're not connecting very well. Yep. Like I said, that observation has not left me. I think about it every day. And these are things that you all know as well. In 2022, we had an extensive listening campaign here, 116 one-to-one conversations that we had. And when we got together to figure out what, what common themes were emerging from all of that work, one of them was a very clear desire for deep connections among us, deeper relationships. It's the reason that today one of our missional priorities is to work to develop deeper relationships, both inward among us and outward, forming new relationships, new connections. When we first formed that, <laughs> we, we picked the word work because we had an acronym going, GROW. <laughs> and we needed a W. I was really resistant to that word work to develop new relationships. But when I hear the story from Luke 15, the kind of diligence of the shepherd who sought, the diligence of the woman who looked for her coin, the longing of the father who must have stayed close enough to the path of the way he thought his son had gone, that he always had an eye looking, maybe he'll come home today. Work seems like the right thing for us to do. Diligence, intention. In Luke 15, in these beloved stories from Jesus, those first two are buttoned up so nicely, though. What a, what a clean story. It all comes together. The sheep and the coin are found and the community parties. But the story of the father and his two sons don't resolve quite so easily, do they? In fact, Luke 15 ends and there's no resolution at all. Well, the father celebrates, he's thrown this party, and he's in with his younger son and all of the gathered community except for the one child who is still outside. Someone must have given word to the father that your older son is hurt and angry and he refuses to come in to this party. The father finally goes out to him, notices what he has lost, and now for the first time, he seeks out the older son. Now we don't know from the story if the older son ended up going in to celebrate or not. The story doesn't give us that detail. And I suppose there's always a risk when we go out seeking that we won't find what it is that we need. But just maybe, and I'm willing to risk that Jesus knew what he was doing, that our story doesn't end with a resolution on purpose. Maybe he knows we might give it some more thought if we don't have an easy answer that we can just run on, that's taken care of. Maybe this is an invitation for us to ask. Who do we notice? Who is missing? Will you go searching for them? I can't promise that you'll find them, but I sure wouldn't want us to miss out on the possibility of a delightful party because we failed to seek for what had been lost. Amen.